Welcome all, all of you to this uh, special event. Uh, before I go any further, I'd, I'd like to make acknowledgement to the traditional owners. Uh, we're gathered on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. And I, w I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri to our north and the Bunurong to our south, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and likewise extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us here tonight. So, a warm woman jacket to you all. Uh, I'd like to particularly also welcome members from the RMIT University School of Health and Biomedical Science. There are some here uh, who are joining us, uh, who helped arrange this joint lecture with the Royal Society of Victoria. And it, our talk tonight features our mutual friend and colleague, Professor Larry Sherman. A little bit more about him in a minute. Uh, and a particular uh, thanks go to the RMIT staff, uh, Professor Charlie Shway and Professor Paul Gorry, who helped us to uh, get this special presentation together tonight. Uh, we're very delighted to welcome back Professor Larry Sherman. He came and presented uh, to us last year on the uh, topic of music and the mind, uh, which was an extremely popular um, uh, talk. And it was just a, a, a happy coincidence that Larry and his family were coming back to Melbourne at this point in time, so we were able to ask him to give this talk tonight on uh, you and your racist brain, uh, the neuroscience of prejudice. Uh, we could have uh, selected a number of other topics because uh, Larry uh, makes a habit of giving uh, all sorts of interesting talks to the public, but we thought uh, the, given the troubling events that have occurred in our nation's political and social arenas in the last uh, little while, that this is actually a, a very timely talk uh, for us to hear. So just a little before I sit down, a little bit about Larry. Um, he's the professor in the Department of Cell Development and Cancer Biology uh, in the Neuroscience Graduate Program at Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon. And he's also based at the Oregon National Primate Research Centre. He is the president of the Oregon chapter of the Society of Neuroscience, and he has many, many papers on neuroscience, particularly neuroscience and brain development, particularly in relation to a particular cell type in the brain, the oligodendrocyte, which is responsible for your brain's being myelinated and the formation of white matter in the brain. And this is an area that is of, of particular interest because a lot of diseases occur which result in the loss of myelin and the loss of uh, brain function. Um, Larry's made many television uh, appearances, radio appearances, and, and particularly given a lot of TED talks because one of the things he does, apart from being uh, an internationally recognised neuroscientist, is to try and get the idea of science and the discussion about science out into the public, into the public, and to engage the public with what scientists do and to get scientists to engage with, with what, the, what the public needs to know. Um, he's been invited by members of Congress to address, to address them on the needs of science and uh, to help Ray keep money flowing to research in the United States. Uh, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry and the Portland Monthly Magazine has recognised Larry as one of the most innovative people in the state of Oregon. And I think you'll find out why uh, that's the case in just a few minutes. So I shall sit down and please welcome Larry Sherman to the podium. Thank you for that introduction. I hope I can live up to all of that. Um, uh, it's great to be back. The last time I was here, I was talking about music and making people sing, which is a lot more fun than talking about racism, I have to say. But let me give you a little more, you heard sort of why I do these talks. Um, uh, as you heard, my lab is really focused on this, what I do in my day job is really focused on trying to fix damaged brains uh, for people with multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease uh, and, um, and other types of related disease, including uh, brain injury in young children. Um, but as the president of Society for Neuroscientists, I do give these talks on, on public matters. And what I do in these talks is I try to spend as much time as I can before I give them. This one actually, I spent about two years reading papers uh, and reading this, the topic to death, basically, to the point where I'm convinced uh, about some aspect of the topic. 
Um, I can tell you there's a lot of really unconvincing science in this field, and I'm not going to tell you about that tonight. And a lot of those papers are unconvincing because they had sample sizes of two uh, and no controls. Um, and I, I don't believe in that kind of science. So uh, I'm not going to talk about those studies tonight. Um, but I am going to tell you what I thought was some pretty convincing and interesting science uh, behind this topic. Uh, and I can also tell you that in, in exploring this topic, it was also a personal explanation for me uh, as someone who grew up uh, in a very white, very privileged neighborhood in La Jolla, California, which uh, uh, was an eye-opener for me when I started actually confronting my own uh, uh, experience with racism. So if you're looking for someone who spends their days uh, investigating this topic, that's not me, and you can't get your money back. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but hopefully this will be interesting to you. So a little bit more about myself. Um, if we think about our perceptions of human beings, uh, and you'll see this in a moment later, uh, within uh, a microsecond or two, your brain is already making judgments about people and characterizing them. And so if I were to just walk into this room, uh, you would see me as a six foot one uh, individual. I have hazel eyes, light brown hair, fair skin. I'd be described as white. Uh, pretty easy, right? Uh, so, um, uh, but I have other things that make me who I am. So when I was growing up in La Jolla, I was a surfer. I used to use words like gnarly and tubular and radical a lot. Um, I had beach blonde, long hair. Um, and this is what I did every morning before school. It was a great way to live, I have to tell you. Um, uh, I was also into baseball, a sport that I know many of you think is abhorrently boring, but I love it. Um, and I played it and I, and I coach it even today. I love to go to our mall where in the old days you had to go to a mall to find a large box like these that had big screens that had very poor resolution and graphics where you played video games and you, uh, you, know, you would eat really horrible food and drink horrible drinks and have a really good time doing it. And then the other thing, I was in a band. Uh, I play keyboards, um, uh, and I was, uh, this is actually me when I was about 16 years old uh, playing at a gig uh, that I used to go to. Our band was named Starjammer. <laughs> Sorry, I know. <laughs> but uh, so these are kind of other things that make me who I am. And then something that you can't really necessarily see by just looking at me is something else that I am, um, and that is I'm a Jew. Now, Jew is one of the few words I know of that is, describes a heritage, a religion, and is an insult, um, all in one. Uh, and I grew up uh, uh, in a, you know, a relatively affluent neighborhood where there weren't a lot of other Jews. Um, and so growing up when I was quite young, uh, I found out about my, my Jewishness, of course, through my family. These are my great-grandparents. This is uh, Sabina Adler on the right and Boris Gruber on the left. He grew up, he was the youngest of nine children uh, in a Jewish family uh, in uh, Odessa, which was then part of the Russian Empire. Might be again soon. And he actually was quite amazing. He uh, kind of escaped service in the military uh, through a substitute program uh, and went off to art school and he learned to become an artist and a dancer. Uh, he actually taught dance lessons to members of the Romanov family. Uh, there's pictures of him with uh, some of the children of Tsar Nicholas II. Um, and uh, had to escape, though, later. Uh, when he finally immigrated, he went up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're not really sure why. Um, and then Sabina actually grew up only 150 miles away from Boris uh, in a town that was part of the Austrian Empire. So he spoke Russian, uh, she spoke German. And they grew up that far away from me, not that far away, 150 miles, not so far. And yet she also somehow wound up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and that's where they met. Uh, so uh, not an uncommon story for people who immigrated to the United States or to here, I'm sure. There's the same stories for uh, people who immigrate everywhere. Boris's family, uh, after he escaped, were all killed in pogroms. This is actually a picture from a pogrom in Odessa. Uh, uh, these are the bodies of Jews who were killed during these pogroms. Um, and unfortunately, Sabina's family were all killed in concentration camps near the Austrian border uh, during World War II. Uh, so they were the, the two of the few people from her, our entire family group who actually made it out of Europe alive. Now, what does that have to do with me? So I, I, did, I never knew them. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any, uh, my, my history, that's all I, I have really of them, uh, but I never knew them. Uh, so being a Jewish kid in La Jolla, you know, wasn't so bad, right? Uh, this is actually me, by the way, in sixth grade, my sixth year. Wasn't I cute? Horrible shirt, though, man. I, 
So uh, the growing up uh, in this environment was great until one day uh, on the playground, some kids who I didn't really know very well came up to me and said, hey, Sherman, where do you go to church? And I said, um, well, I don't go to church. I, I go to a synagogue. I'm Jewish. And they walked away. And that afternoon, they beat me up. Two of them held me down while the other one beat me. I came home with a bloody nose and a concussion and the whole nine yards. And of course, I wouldn't tell on them because that would make things even worse for me. Um, and that was my first um, introduction to anti-Semitism. So thankfully, I haven't actually had many more incidents like that since then. I had a very bad year that year, but since then, nothing really happened. It wasn't too bad. But having said that, this was a, a, a study from the ADL Global Index back in 2014, um, and it was estimating that one-fourth of the world's adults are openly anti-Semitic. In other words, they're willing to happily admit to the fact that they hate Jews. If one-fourth of them admit to it, you've got to figure the number is probably higher in terms of people who actually have those feelings. Um, what's more, if you look um, in the United States, one in 11 people openly admit to being anti-Semitic. And this was, again, from 2014. That number might be higher now, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so that's a rather startling number, I think, for the 21st century. Um, I grew up uh, with Star Trek, the original Star Trek, right? And, and so when I was growing up, I, I had this view of the world that was going to be so amazing because on the bridge of the USS Enterprise, there was an Asian officer. There was an African-American officer. Well, she was an African-American, but the actress was. Um, there, there was a guy from Scotland, for God's sakes. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was an amazing collection of people. Diversity was just an unquestionable thing. Um, and so that sort of, in the 1970s, was my view of how the world was evolving. Uh, and sadly, it hasn't really worked out that way. Now, coming away from anti-Semitism and going towards more is broader, issues, uh, broader issues of prejudice, up to 56% of Americans, um, and this was from 2012, again, so these numbers will probably change, uh, up to 50, and a, this is also, by the way, an Associated Press survey, not, I grant you, the most accurate uh, polling system. Uh, however, the numbers are pretty staggering when you, even when you rule out noise. Up to 56% of Americans will demonstrate uh, actually moderate to extreme anti-African-American -Ameri anti feelings, uh, and a similar number feel like the same way about Latino Americans. Uh, and so this is an alarming uh, piece of information. And back in 2012, people were kind of scratching their heads about this. Uh, however, this was just from last year, actually almost exactly a year ago, uh, this was the Charlottesville um, demonstrations, which led to the death of one of the uh, counter-protesters. Um, and we're seeing this all through the United States. Uh, we've seen this in Los Angeles. Uh, so what's going on here? Now, I've told you about sort of the more, more overt issues that we're going to talk about tonight. Let me tell you about something a little more subtle. I'm a baseball fan, I told you. And so I've always thought of baseball being a very pure sport. This was a study done um, over the course of two seasons of uh, American professional Major League Baseball, 2004 to 2006, and over 2.1 million pitches by pitchers, not so different from a cricket pitcher, um, were being counted and analyzed. And what came out of the study was that in these games, the umpires tended to call a higher number of strikes, which is what the pitcher wants, they want to strike you out, for uh, pitchers who were the same race that the umpire was. That really makes me angry. So, um, so we have to, this is not just something that, that um, is happening in an overt way, but also in subtle ways that are not so easy to detect. So this brings me to the questions of racism uh, versus racial prejudice. And, and, and I want to get our words straight tonight because uh, I've, I did three radio interviews this week uh, and this question kept, kept coming up. When we talk about uh, racial or group prejudice, we're talking about behavior. We're talking about individual behavior, and it's a behavior towards an out-group, and that out-group could be anybody, uh, by members of an in-group. That in-group can be anybody. If, you, if the dominant race in a particular group, when we talk about racial prejudice, is white, then the in-group is the whites. If it's, if it's Chinese, then it's Chinese. If it's African, some African group, it's African. It depends on where you are. But this is the, the definition of prejudice. Outgroup members um, are showing uh, behaviors that are based on no actual experience 
and no actual reason other than the fact that they're different. Racial prejudice is what our, our kind of, what we talk about, we're talking about implicit bias. So when we look at somebody, our brain has a reaction to that person, and if they are different from us in, in ways that involve race, that would be called racial prejudice. We have this reaction to them that's not rational, it's not based on experience, um, so we treat them differently than we would treat other people. But racism, really, if we define it, is a system. A system in which one group has advantages over another strictly based on race. So if you live in a society where there's a in-group or a dominant group and they have advantages that other people don't have, that's, you're in a racist system, basically. And one of these things does lead to the other, right? But that's how we're going to talk about this tonight. So the big question is, um, and I don't mean to suggest that the racist brain really is smaller, um, but is there some neuroscientific ba uh, basis for prejudicial behavior when we engage in prejudice? Um, and if there is, how do we overcome it or how can we promote everybody overcoming it? So the first question that often comes up, of course, is are we born this way? Are we born uh, exhibiting uh, racial or group prejudice? Um, well, when can we first detect it? That's maybe even a better question. And this comes from studies done by David Kelly at Sheffield. Um, and he took newborn infants um, and showed that they really demonstrated no particular preference for other people when they were being picked up by other people who were different races than their parents. Um, and this, was, this happened up to about three months. So these, these children are, are happy to be looking and scanning faces and they scan their parents' race faces as much as other races about the same until about three months. And then after about three months, what happens is when somebody who's not of the same race as the parent picks them up, they start scanning much longer. They start really spending more time discriminating, and not in a negative way, but just the act of discriminating one thing from another. Uh, and that means your brain is kicking in the ability to do that. So that's about the time your brain starts to see the difference. One of the things that we uh, are very good at is teaching kids not to talk about race. Beverly uh, Daniel Tatum, who uh, teaches uh, topics of race uh, and is African American, tells a story of taking her uh, son to a store and uh, uh, he starts playing with a small white boy who's the same age and they start talking and playing and chattering away and then uh, one of the two parents had to leave and so the boys said goodbye to each other and as the, uh, the white boy's uh, uh, leaving with his mom, he asks the mom, why is that boy's skin so dark? And the mother's response goes, shh, we don't talk about that. Rushed him out of the store out of embarrassment, right? When a better answer and a response might have been, oh, well, that boy's skin just has a different kind of pigment in it, which causes it to be a different color, that's all. Those are two very different things for, to a child to see and hear. We may be embarrassed by these questions when our children ask them, but the fact is that we're t teaching them that race is a taboo subject from the very beginning of their lives. Um, and as a result, we don't talk about race. Have you talked about race lately? <laughs> I mean, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. So this, was, uh, this is something that Beverly Daniel Tatum has actually documented and, and, and described. We, we teach this very early on. The other thing is, in the United States, and this has been true for a long time, it's better than it used to be, but you basically have children, no matter how much bubber, bubble wrap you wrap around your child, they're going to get out at some point. You hope they're going to get out, otherwise they're going to call social services on you, it's going to be a problem. They're going to get out at some point and they're going to be at a friend's house or they're going to see a billboard ad or they're going to be in an office someplace and thumb through a magazine and they're going to see images that are stereotypes of people of color. That, and that is still very true today. If you turn on American television, the majority of the time you see an African-American on TV, chances are there's something wrong with that person. Something, they're either doing some sort of criminal act or something else is going on. Same for people, other people of color. Uh, and certainly these days, even, even worse for Muslim Americans who are, who are being stereotyped in really horrible ways. Now, this is going to sink into these kids' brains. They soak it up. And the result is, by the time they're about four or five, uh, children in the U.S., and again, this is all studies I'm being talking about are in the U.S. I did try to find some studies in Australia, again, looking for sample sizes bigger than two or three. Um, they're on their way, I think. But what happened in this study, this is Margaret Beale Spencer at the University of Chicago. She brought kids into a room with two dolls that were identical in every single way except for their skin tone. And then she asked leading questions of these children. 
Which doll do you think your parents would rather you play with? Which doll would you trust more? Questions like that. And what was disturbing was not only did the white children answer for the, in the affirmative for the white doll, so did the children of color by age five. So this, was, this is something that's happening really quickly in our children's development. So the result is we perceive people who are not like us as the out-group. And people in the out-group perceive themselves as being excluded from being in the in-group. And there's nothing worse for our brains, no, nothing that will get your brain upset more than when you feel you're being left out of something. We all want some sort of acknowledgement in our lives. And this is something that happens in, in this group setting. In addition, we perceive these people who are not like us as the out-group, and we fear people who we do not identify as being a member of the in-group. And fear is a huge driver and a learned response uh, towards prejudicial behavior, which brings us to the question of fear. So if we define fear, it's an unpleasant emotion that's caused by the idea that someone or something is going to cause you harm or pain or even death. Um, and it's a good idea. Fear is an adaptive response. Uh, and Darwin, Darwin brought this up himself. And it's a good idea, right? There are people who uh, don't learn to fear things. If we, if we learn to fear things that are going to be harmful to us, we avoid those things. And that's why we're all sitting here as a species right now tonight. If we don't have fear, we're in trouble. Uh, and, there, and then we get this type of response. <laughs> uh, if you can't read the bottom, it says, many ideas start with the phrase, hold my beer and watch this. And I think we don't want this, right? So we learn to fear things. When we were still living in, in small community groups and caves and so forth, that we wanted to protect our own, right? So when we saw other groups coming to us that were unfamiliar, we probably reacted to them to try to protect ourselves against them. Um, but of course, in modern society, that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, and so it's a very primitive part of the brain that's having this reaction. Um, and it's, I, I'm sure you know, in the animal world, we have something called altruism, where you're going to protect people in your own family over, or your own group over other groups to, to kind of protect your DNA, if you will. Uh, but that doesn't make sense in a human society where we have you know, multinational, multicultural uh, interactions. And this actually goes back to, I suspect, I suspect everybody in this room remembers Pavlov, uh, but just to go over that, just in case you forgot, um, Pavlov was the Russian fellow with the dogs, right? So this is Ivan Pavlov, um, and Ivan Pavlov had a kennel in his, where he was doing his research, uh, and noticed one day that the dogs in this kennel not only salivated when the technician who fed them brought food to them, but pretty much any time that technician came into the room, even without food, and said, aha, there's something going on here, and let's test it, and started to do experiments in what we call classical conditioning. So the idea is you've got, before conditioning, a dog that looks at its bowl, and it starts drooling, all right? Now, if you ring a bell for most dogs, they don't drool. If they do drool, then something's wrong, okay? So, but they don't usually do that. So if you now do something called conditioning, where you every time bring the food in, you ring the bell, over a, a number of trials, what will happen is all you have to do is ring the bell, and the dog starts to salivate. Now, what we have here in the case of the bell is what we call the neutral stimulus. In other words, a stimulus that should not elicit the behavioral response that you're looking for. And then you have the unconditioned stimulus, which in this case is food the stimulus that should elicit that response under normal conditions. And then you have the unconditioned response, which is salivating. Then when you start pairing things, now you have the conditioned stimulus, which is the bell paired with the food, and the conditioned response, which is salivating in response to the bell alone. So interestingly, after Pavlov described these experiments, people started wondering if you could do the same thing to human beings. Now, there was a study, if you can call it that, coming back to sample size issues, which was, is described in almost every psychology textbook and yet would never be approved to be done today, would never be considered a serious piece of data, and yet it was done. Uh, and that is often referred to as the Little Albert experiment, which was done in 1920 by John Watson and his graduate student, Rosalie Rayner. And in addition to having a lot of ethical concerns about what was done in this study, the two of them had an affair, which made things all the more interesting. So, but basically, the story goes like this. Um, there was a baby in, in, in a ward um, who was taken from the ward. It's not clear if anybody gave them permission to take this baby from the ward. Nobody to this day knows who he was or is. 
Um, there have been a lot of publications claiming that they know who he was, but they've all sort of led to dead ends after being researched again. So we're not sure what happened to Albert. It was not his name. Uh, and what happened was in this experiment, they would bring um, furry creatures in for little Albert to check out. And uh, they included apparently a white rat, um, a, a white cat, uh, I think a white monkey. How they got a white monkey into the hospital, I don't know. Um, um, and uh, he would just explore them and, and be curious about them like any baby would. So what they did then was they decided to uh, introduce the white rat. This is before conditioning, there's no fear, he's just curious. Um, but then what they would do is they would find some stimulus which was unpleasant. In this case, it was hitting a steel bar with a hammer to make a very loud uh, sound, which will induce the startle reflex. So startling is, is something we all do. It's, it's kind of hardwired. And um, of course, Albert would cry when you hit the, the bar. Um, and then what they did was they started bringing in the rat and hitting the bar every time the rat entered the room to get that natural reflex, fear reflex. And after a time, what happened was every time the white rat entered the room, little Albert started to cry. Now what's interesting is it wasn't just the white rat, even though the white rat was the stimulus, other white furry things also caused Albert to cry. And there's a very creepy picture of, of, uh, of, of him, the, the investigator, wearing a Santa Claus beard and Albert's trying to get away from him. Very strange. So poor Albert, um, we don't know what happened to him as I mentioned. He may have a fear of Santa Clauses now. Um, um, but the thing that was interesting was they didn't do anything to kind of undo this conditioning. Um, now, fear conditioning can be reversed. And in fact, this is the basis for theory, uh, uh, ther uh, therapies for people who have traumatic events occur in their lives. One of them is through extinction. So the idea is, yes, this condition stimulus is causing him to cry because he keeps expecting the loud startling noise to happen. But over time, he'll realize that that's not happening. And eventually, he'll stop crying. He may be not e at ease with the rat, but he won't be crying in response to it. Um, there's other things you can do, of course, too, which is to pair the white rat now with something positive, like milk and cookies. All right? so, uh, if, and then you can also overcome that. Again, a therapeutic idea for uh, uh, sort of uh, therapies for all sorts of anxiety and, and uh, traumatic uh, disorders. Uh, but they did do that with a little Albert, and so um, we're just not sure what happened to him. Nonetheless, this is a, an example of how fear is a conditioned to learn response. And when we fear things that we don't know, we have these responses to them that can be quite strong and quite physiological. So given that, what is the neural basis uh, for what we call automatic prejudice? Uh, and let me get, uh, clarify what I mean by that. A response to something new or someone new who's unfamiliar looking uh, that we just sort of have. And what, and what does that look like physiologically? So I'm going to give you guys a quick neuroscience lesson to kind of cover some of this. Um, this is just a cartoon showing the structure of basic electrical units of our brain, a neuron. Um, you can see here, here's the cell body. Most of us think of cells as these round things with round things in the middle of them. So this is the round thing, the big round thing right here. And the round thing in the middle is the nucleus where the DNA is. But neurons have a really cool, unique architecture that's different from other cells. They have these little structures or branch structures that come off of them called dendrites. And these can be very long or very short, depending on where they have to make connections. They can be very heavily branched or very simple. But at the end of the day, this is where electrical information enters the cell from other cells. And it's then carried down this long branch here called the axon. And axons can also be very short or very long uh, and somewhat branched, depending on what kind of connections they're making. Surrounding axons is a substance I study extensively in my lab. It's called, not all axons have it, but the ones that need to go fast uh, carry the substance called myelin, which insulates the axon, but more importantly, uh, dramatically increases the speed at which axons fire. Now, uh, most of us have more than one neuron. <laughs> most of us. Um, and here's a dendrite cartoon again, and there's these little blebs that come off of it. And you can see these are axons making connections to the dendrite. So you can have many hundreds of axons interacting with a single cell, integrating all sorts of information from different places in the brain. What's interesting is these connections are not uh, physical connections. Uh, the connections are called synapses, and it turns out they are actually chemical connections. So you can see in this cartoon, nerve impulses firing. Here is an axon coming down here. Here's a dendrite. You're going to see that it's going to fire, and stuff is going to be released into the space here, causing this, this dendrite to fire. 
And that stuff uh, is, is our vesicles containing uh, neurotransmitters. You've probably heard of some of these. Dopamine is one, uh, acetylcholine or epinephrine or adrenaline. And that, this firing response requires energy. And where do we get our energy for if you're a cell? You get it from the bloodstream. If we looked at our, our brains and just took everything away except for the blood vessels, you would still see pretty much as a very dense structure that looked like the brain because there are so many tiny capillaries and, and venules and everything else that are carrying blood to these cells. And you can actually visualize that in a live brain using a, pro a process called two-photon uh, confocal microscopy. And if anybody wants to know more about that, I'll say, about, say it later. But this is an actual live brain being imaged in such a way these are blood vessels here coursing through areas of dendrites and axons uh, in this area of the brain. So when these cells have to fire, they actually communicate through other cells called astrocytes with these blood vessels and cause the, the, the diameter of those blood vessels to increase such that more blood can come through. And we can actually measure that change in real time um, using a process called functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. Has, how many of you have had an MRI? Wow, quite a few of you. What's, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> um, those of you who've had one know that they're extraordinarily noisy machines. Uh, if you've had to put your head in one of these things, you know they're very claustrophobic inducing. Um, but yet people can get, get into them. You can put noise canceling headphones on them. And what's more, you can ask people to do things so long as they keep their head completely still, which is a challenge. But you can show them pictures and do other things. And that's what I'm going to show you some data from tonight. And what's happening in these machines, when we do functional resonance imaging, most of you probably had, um, uh, were, were having just some sort of structural examination. But for the functional MRIs, what they're doing is looking at that change in the diameter of those blood vessels as a reflection of the activity of that area of the brain, what was happening when those neurons are firing and need that energy. So for, for those of you who are here for my music talk, uh, you'll recognize this slide. This is, a, this is a brain listening to music compared to silence. These are areas of the brain that light up just when you're sitting there in that MRI machine listening to some music. So as I mentioned, uh, people respond to um, visual cues in, in milliseconds or less. And the way these experiments were done that I'm going to show you is people were flashed images on a screen. And then this fMRI procedure uh, went forward. I'm going to do a little demonstration of this for you. The, what I'm going to show you is going to be flashed on for about uh, uh, 10 times longer than what they saw. But let's see how much information you can get from it. If you look to the left side of the screen right now, can somebody tell me uh, or describe the person who is in that image? Anybody? So older African-American male. Very good. All right. Uh, look on the right side of the screen. We'll do another one. Anybody want to give me some data about that person? Very good. And smiling. You, you just gave me a ton of information from a very short burst of, of, of imagery. And as I said, you can actually get even about the same amount of information from an even shorter burst that's about uh, 10 times shorter. So in these experiments I'm going to show you right now, that's the kind of information that these uh, subjects were presented with. So the first study that I'm going to describe to you was a recruitment of uh, Caucasian U.S. males. Uh, there was no predetermination pre of uh, their level of prejudice. Uh, and there are instruments, psychological instruments that people use for that. Um, and in this particular study, what was done was uh, people were shown unfamiliar faces of other white uh, people. And it was always males to males in this particular study. And or unfamiliar pictures of people of color. Now, one of the things that happens when we get these bursts of information is the first thing our brain has to figure out is, what am I looking at? And there are areas of our brain that light up specifically in response to faces. Basically, this is an area of the brain that says, you're looking at a face. Um, and this is an area right here, uh, which you see lighting up. It's called the fusiform gyrus. Um, and in this experiment, within a, you know, the milliseconds or so of looking at this unfamiliar white face, this subject saw a face. It's basically, that's what the brain is telling you. Now, when these subjects were shown unfamiliar people of color's faces, something interesting happened. The first area to light up was not the fusiform gyrus. It actually had a delay in terms of when it got turned on. The first area that light up, lit up instead was the amygdala, 
And the amygdala is an area of our brain that in, is involved in a lot of different processes in learning and memory and everything else. But in particular, it also uh, lights up in response to threats. The amygdala does a lot of different things for us and it's really important for memory and everything else, but it also helps us respond to things that we see as the threats versus challenges versus not, not threats. Um, so that lights up in, these, in people who see another person as a threat based on their race, for example. Um, but uh, it's a part of the brain that is involved in so many of the processes and is controlled by our frontal cortex. Mm. And so we can overcome that, again, using strategies. Most of us don't re respond violently, for example, to someone just because they look different from us. Not anymore, because we have this frontal cortex that can overcome and override mm. that response. And so there's something called the cross-race effect. Um, and the cross-race effect is, is a fu funny way of, of uh, I don't know about you guys, but my mom was born in the 1920s, and uh, she was pretty racist. Um, and we were driving along one day, and there was a fellow who used to come to our house. His name was Mr. Johnson. I don't know his first name. I was only seven, and not told, I was told never to ask first names of adults. Um, and uh, we were driving along one day, and there was a guy, I swore it was Mr. Johnson. And I said, Mom, I think that's Mr. Johnson. And her response to me was, I don't know, they all look the same to me. And I remember having, you know, Thanksgiving dinners and arguing with her about that, because I remembered it for so many years. It's like, what do you mean they all look the same to you? That's Mr. Johnson, he, look, he doesn't look like everybody else. That's a child's view of the world, right? So, so um, but the fact is, when we don't have a brain that lights up initially and sees a face, there's something to this, right? There may be something to this. We tend to have a better ability to recognize faces that we are familiar with uh, in groups that we are familiar with in groups that we are not familiar with. So that is one piece of, of interesting and somewhat startling information. Then the question is, as a result of this threat response, if this is happening at a more chronic level, what happens to us physiologically in response to that? Um, and the bottom line is, we have a stress response. So when we are in situations where we encounter people that are not like us, or in situations where people around us are treating us a certain way uh, that is not good for us, we have chronic stress. Now, part of the thing that happens when we have chronic stress is there are hormones that are released into our bloodstream, and one of those hormones is cortisol. Now, cortisol is part of what everybody refers to as the fight or flight response. And when I was in school, I, all the way from elementary school up to college, I remember was, the way this was always described was some dude walking in the forest, going into a cave and encountering a bear. It was always a bear, all right? Um, and then you had to make the decision, am I going to stay and fight this bear? Bad idea. Um, or am I going to run like hell from this bear? Better idea. Um, and so what's going to happen is cortisol is going to change your physiology in ways that are going to gear you up to do just that. Now, if what happens in a stressful situation, it starts with the hypothalamus, another part of the brain, um, and that releases a hormone called CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormone. That, in turn, activates the pituitary gland, a stalk that hangs down from the bottom of your base of your brain, nicely encased in bone, it's very well protected. But that is released, that hormones from that gland are released throughout the body. Um, and the hormone that's released there is ACTH, adrenocorticotropin hormone, which in turn activates the adrenal glands, which are on the top of your kidneys. And that's where the cortisol is released from. Now, cortisol can be released systemically throughout the body. It also goes back to your brain and has effects there. And I'm gonna talk about some of those. Cortisol is a hormone that really shouldn't stay high. It's meant to go up when there's a threat and then go away when the threat's gone. So if you're in a constant state of stress like that, it causes incredible damage to the body. If we look at people who describe themselves as experiencing high levels of internalized racism, in other words, people who describe themselves as feeling like they're in a, an environment where they don't have the advantages that everybody around them does, um, their cortisol levels are significantly higher uh, than people who have low levels of perceived internalized racism. Um, this was a study from 2005. Now, there's a consequence to having high chronic levels of cortisol. Um, it's really damaging to tissues. And so high levels of cortisol have been implicated in weight gain, changes in metabolic system that lead to diabetes and metabolic disorders, uh, arthritis, decreased immune function, depression, hypertension, fatigue, problems with sleep and headaches, so-called tunnel vision, acid reflux disease, and hostility, increased hostility and hypervigilance.
are all side effects of, of cortisol being high. And in fact, if you look at, for example, people who have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or other types of anxiety disorders linked to trauma, you will find that they have these spikingly high levels of cortisol. And hostility is a side effect of this disease, and hypervigilance are, 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 are effects of that condition. If you look at the top eight causes of death among African Americans, um, this was from 2010, so it's outdated. Uh, our CDC has had its funding cut, so I don't know when the next time we'll see this again. But we have heart disease, cancer, stroke, all of these conditions, including homicide, that can be exacerbated by all the things I just told you. My argument along those lines has been that racism uh, is a public health problem because it's causing this chronic stress and this chronic damage. And, and you know, it's exacerbating uh, health conditions that would otherwise not be so serious. Now, coming back to what I do, neuroscience, um, I study a part of the brain called the hippocampus. It's part about half of what I do in my lab. The hippocampus is the structure here, kind of deep in our brains. Kind of looks like an upside down seahorse, hence the name hippocampus. And the hippocampus is now known to be a critical part of our brain that's involved in learning and memory. So what's amazing about this, this part of the brain is if we break it down into different parts, there's a part of the brain called the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. It's right here. And inside this dentate gyrus um, is this granule cell layer. These blue cells here are all this, the nuclei of neurons that have been packed very tightly together. And at the base of this here, there are cells, uh, some, of these, some of them are in red, that are referred to as neural stem cells or neural progenitor cells. And it's been shown now that these are cells that can become new neurons in a process called neurogenesis. Now there was a controversial question put out there a number of years ago as to whether this happens in the adult human brain. It clearly happens in other mammals. And a paper just came out a few months ago in, I believe, Nature, claiming that it doesn't seem to happen in adult humans. However, subsequent to that paper being published, three other papers came out saying it does. Um, and I can tell you that in our own experience from uh, autopsy cases and other uh, people that we've looked at, we do see that neurogenesis happens in the adult. It happens very rarely, uh, but it can be induced under certain circumstances. And all of the drugs that we know that block neurogenesis also have a side effect, which is impaired learning and memory. So there's a good data in the, in the mammalian literature, the, the non-human mammalian literature, and also in non-human primates, who are more closely related to us, that blocking neurogenesis blocks learning and memory. So these stem cells I mentioned are capable of turning into all the cells in our brains. The ones that are in the hippocampus are, are preferentially turning into new neurons, but they can turn into uh, the glial cells, including the uh, astrocytes that I mentioned and other cells. And what's interesting is chronically elevated cortisol is really bad for neural stem cells. So there's a study shown uh, that, in fact, it induces the death of neural stem cells, um, and it may be linked to chronic learning and memory problems later in life, as well as depression. So some of those symptoms I mentioned linked to chronically high cortisol may actually be due to aberrant levels of, of neurogenesis that are occurring. What's interesting is if you take that high cortisol away, there's recovery. So getting rid of that stress is a good thing because it can actually cause recovery of all of these, these, these things from happening. Now there's a something else that's really remarkable um, and that is that there appear to be changes that happen to our DNA uh, as a result of exposure to types of stress. Um, and these are re referred to as epigenetic. Um, so let's go over that for a moment. Coming back to, I'm sure everybody in this room remembers our DNA, uh, the four letter code, adenine, A, thymine, T, guanine, G, and cytosine, C. And these A's and T's link up and the G's and C's will link up to each other and they form this beautiful double hel helix that Rosalind Franklin uh, really described and Watson and Crick stole from her. Um, and, and what's remarkable is these DNA molecules then can be transcribed, copied, if you will, into RNA molecules, single-stranded RNA molecules, uh, and those do not use uh, the thymine, but they ra rather use uracil, but otherwise it's uh, G, C, A, and U in this case. This RNA then can be read uh, into little, little three-letter codons, we call them. So if you have a uracil, a uracil, and a guanine, that'll make an amino acid called leucine. And so and the other amino acids can be made by different sequences. These then get strung together to form proteins through a process called translation. 
uh, and proteins then are the building blocks of every cell and every part of our body, all right? including our neurons. Now, remarkably, the stress I mentioned response has nothing to do with changing the A's, the T's, and the C's, and the G's, and the DNA, or the RNA. But it can actually lead to chemical modifications in the DNA that are epigenetic and around the coding parts of the DNA that will turn the genes off or on abnormally. One of those changes is called DNA methylation, where a methyl group is added to some of the C's, especially in the non-coding part of the DNA that controls whether or not the gene is turned on or off. Um, and another one is actually um, a, a modification that affects histones, which are proteins that the DNA wraps around, and how the DNA wraps around those proteins can dictate how well those genes are turned on or off as well. So histone deacetylation or acetylation can turn genes off or on, DNA methylation can do the same. So it turns out chronically elevated stress, um, and this is through cortisol, has been linked to changes in DNA methylation of a number of different genes that run the th functions of neurons. Furthermore, there's a study done actually directly linked to what we're talking about tonight. Compared to white subjects, black subjects, and this was done in the US again, have substantially reduced global DNA methylation, and this has actually been linked to cancer. So DNA methylation can turn genes off, remember. So if you turn genes on that drive cell growth abnormally, you may be setting yourself up to be predisposed to certain types of cancer. The other thing that we've been able to show is that changes in uh, DNA methylation have also been observed in genes that control how nerve cells function. And this could have profound effects on, on your nervous system and, and your ability to do all sorts of things. Uh, what's striking is that some of these changes, these so-called epigenetic changes, um, can be passed down uh, to your children. So if you have a situation where stress from being in a situation of involving racism uh, is driving these epigenetic changes, you may be passing some of that down to your children. Mm -hmm. Now it's not clear how many generations that will go down, um, and there's some suggestion that some of this could be reversible. Uh, so it's not, it's not a, a one-way path. Uh, uh, and all of us have, have somehow inherited epigenetic changes from our families' mm -hmm. uh, experiences. We've had people who've had stress over our, our generations, obviously. Um, but again, it's, it's a remarkable finding to suggest, again, that this is a real health problem. Mm -hmm. We need to really be aware of the uh, consequences of all of this. So coming back to these changes that I've mentioned, so what then are the costs? Uh, and challenges for people who are racists and, uh, uh, and victims of racism. So I mentioned that if you're in a stressful situation, like being in a racist environment, your cortisol is gonna be high. Well, what about racists? What if you're somebody who really can't stand all the people around you or you fear them all the time? You're gonna be stressed out too, right? And here's a great demonstration of this. So it turns out our body responds differently in terms of its physiological responses to challenges and threats. Challenges are good things. When we have a challenge before us, something we want to accomplish, um, like giving this talk tonight, um, more blood goes to your muscles and enhances your physical performance. I don't really need that. But more blood also goes to your brain, enhancing your cognitive performance. So these are things you need when you're under sub or a challenge situation. But threats actually do something different. They restrict blood flow to muscles and brain, and they release cortisol. And this is because of this fight or flight response. There's very specific things you want to do physiologically to get through this emergency situation, right? So I don't know if any, have any of you ever heard of the game Boggle? Okay, so Boggle was a very simple game, not threatening at all. Um, and there was a study called the Boggle Experiment where white men were paired with other white men or African-American men. Um, and then there are various hormonal responses and autonomic responses were measured during the experience of playing this rather innocuous game. And what was remarkable was, when playing with a white partner, white subjects responded to this as a challenge. But when playing with a black partner, most white subjects, not all, responded to this as a threat, all right? So our basic interaction with another human being can be altered by something that starts with this change in facial recognition, this threat response. It's, it's, par it's kind of setting you up to see the world in a very different way. Another version of this was the interview experiment. And in this experiment, this was interesting, that they actually uh, had subjects that were recruited online. 
and they were asked to take a survey that sort of measured their level of what we call automatic prejudice. Um, and then subjects were paired with white or black partners, and they were interviewed in a job interview-like setting, and there was a payoff to this. So if they did a really good job, there was a payoff. So there was a reason for them to want to do well in this setting. Among the more prejudiced subjects, cortisol spiked, and another hormone called DHEAS, which is actually a, a hormone that you need uh, for repairing tissue damage, uh, actually went down uh, when they were interviewed by non-whites. But in the less prejudiced individuals, cortisol remained the same, DHEAS levels uh, were actually in increased. Um, and other physiological markers in different versions of this experiment showed the same thing, a challenge versus threat response depending on the level of prejudice experienced by the white subjects. Not only being a victim of racism can cause this high level of cortisol, but being a racist uh, you know, can, can do this too. If you're in a state where you're constantly feeling threatened by the people around you, your cortisol is also going to be high. Mm -hmm. So coming to terms and again, this acquaintance with, with these people that are around you, if you have a relationship with them and, and relieve that stress, it's going to be better for you in the long run. So, it's, so this is bad for racists and for people who are victims of racism. But there's some good news. Now, coming back to that face recognition study I, I mentioned in the very beginning. So I don't know how many of you know who that face is on the right. Uh, he's a famous actor, and this particular role was someone who you should be very afraid of, okay? But just the fact that they were famous and, and a picture like this was shown to them was, a, uh, was able to overcome this facial versus amygdala response. So if you know who this is, doesn't matter what, who the race it was, it's a face, okay? So that was one really interesting point. Another was, if they showed an unfamiliar face to the subject, but before putting them in the scanner, showed them a quick picture of the face and just mentioned maybe 20 or 30 seconds worth of information about that person, like this is Dave and he works at Intel uh, and he has two kids uh, and he likes soccer, all right? Just that kind of basic information, it was a face again. So a very small amount of familiarity really changed the way people looked about this. And there's some studies to suggest the same for the physiological reaction to being in the room with somebody who's, you have these attitudes, prejudicial attitudes about. A little bit of familiarity makes you see them as someone who's not a threat, so your stress levels don't go up. Uh, changes, physiological changes associated with stress like cortisol don't go up in your body. Um, so just a little familiar, familiarity seems to be the main thing. And that helps rewire you to understand not only that person, but sometimes even those groups of people. This uh, slide, this, this, this outcome was really interesting. I gave this talk to um, a group of Portland police officers. And Portland police officers have been in some situations where there's definitely been racially motivated changes in the way they're treating uh, our citizens. And they said, you know, this is really remarkable what you've been saying because we police officers are stressed all the time. Being a police officer is a very stressful job. Our cortisol levels must be through the roof. I said, I'm sure they are. And I said, now you introduce a situation where we're put into, uh, into neighborhoods where we don't know anybody and we have this implicit bias effect that you've just described, that's gonna throw our cortisol even higher. I said, yeah, probably will. He says, we need to bring back community policing. The way we're policing, and this is true in the United States, um, police now are becoming kind of the us versus them as opposed to parts of our community, mm. right? They're not, they're not people we're familiar with. The police that come to our neighborhoods are not people we know. Uh, and they're putting on more and more equipment and, and things to kind of separate themselves from us and, and become their kind of threats to us, right, in a, in a way. Um, and I don't think that's true. And I think most police are, are fantastic people. Um, everyone I've met has been great. But you could understand how that separation from the community that you're policing is going to lead you to be more stressful and the people in the community to be more stressed out about the police. It, in the old days, you know, there were police who would walk the beat. They would, they would know people. They'd, get involved in soccer games or, or baseball games and things in our communities and know everybody in their community. That's such a different environment. And I think uh, if you could come back to that somehow, uh, it would go a long ways towards relieving that stress. And I think the same could be sa said for just people in general. Um, getting involved more with people and, and trying to really just understand each other's points of view and, and who everybody is in different parts of your community uh, would go a long way towards solving that problem. This is, this is something I think we all know about. Uh, in football matches, people do 
fall down and show themselves to be in pain an awful lot. And some of them remarkably get up really quickly um, uh, from that pain. However, what's remarkable is if you look at this, this, this particular slide um, and you are looking at somebody who is the same race as you are in that pain, you will have responses that kind of equate with supposedly empathy to a much higher degree if the person is the same race as you are. Um, so that's, that's, this is involving areas of the brain called the cingulate cortex and the insular cortex. We can show this activation. Um, and so that's, it does, and it doesn't matter whose team you're on. If they're the same race as you, you have a little higher empathy than you would for somebody else who is in pain. What's remarkable is if they're on the same team, you have higher levels of empathy for the people even if they're of a different race than you are. So it's all about whose team they're on. It's not about which race they are anymore. So that really changes your physiological response and your brain's response to uh, a situation you want empathy. There was a similar study done in China where uh, Chinese subjects were shown um, Chinese faces uh, that were in pain. They actually had a Photoshop version of a pin going, in, it was really kind of gross, a uh, pin going into the side of their face. Um, and when they showed this, this effect, uh, they said that the peop Chinese people, seeing Chinese people being hurt, uh, led to high levels of empathy. When other people who were non-Chinese were seeing the same thing, empathy was much lower. But if they were in a group somehow that was on a team that these people liked, then the empathy came back. So again, it's, it's, it's sort of this, your brain saying, okay, if, if they're part of my team, it's okay. Then that brings me to another set of experiments. There have been several groups who have shown the same thing where if you get a group of people who are together who are not the same race, who have these uncomfortable physiological cortisol, DHEA responses uh, together in a room, if it's just a one-on-one -on -one situation, you have this challenge versus threat switching response. But if you put them all together in a team against another team of people and give them some sort of task to achieve, it goes away. So teamwork leads to uh, a reduction in these responses. So I mentioned that I grew up in the 70s and that um, I, I was really a fan of this, what was happening on the bridge of Star Trek. And uh, I think that was a really cool idea, but I also just told you that we make judgments about people and we can identify all sorts of features of people within a millisecond of seeing them. Our brains are not gonna let us be colorblind, right? Color blindness is probably the worst thing we could try to do, even though that's what we were all told we were supposed to be doing. But in fact, what we need to be doing is, as institutions and as individuals is embracing the fact that there are differences and embracing the fact that people who have different backgrounds have different experiences and that maybe people who are in the in group are not gonna be very sympathetic of those experiences because they haven't experienced it. If a, an African-American girl walks up to her friend after a class and her friend is white and says something about the teacher making an off-color joke, a racist joke, uh, the white student's typical response might be, they were just joking. But if you're the subject of that joke, it's a very different world. And if you've been the subject of that joke multiple times, it's a very different world and a very different response you're going to have. So as a result, there has been an effort to try to encourage groups to come together, to share their experiences, to try to identify these experiences, and then come back as emissaries to the larger community. And this started with work from William Cross, and this was for people of color. Um, and the idea is you have stages where you kind of identify in your own mind what's going on in your world, so you can be a better person coming out of it to talk about it to everybody else. The stages start with something called pre-encounter, where you're exposed to the dominant culture, the in-group, um, but you don't really have much awareness of yourself as other. Young children in school tend not to think about these things. They tend not to react to these things unless their, their parents have been really teaching them specifically to react a specific way to people of color. But then comes a point called encounter, the realization that racism exists um, and that you're categorized in yourself as part of the out-group. This is followed by immersion and immersion, redefining of yourself and dissociating from a dominant culture peer group and immersing yourself in your ethnic peer group. Uh, Beverly Tatum, uh, who I mentioned before, has a book called Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria? Well, it's because they can share their experiences with each other. They have shared information and, and, ex and experiences. 
that are not being heard uh, by their white friends. Um, and this is exactly what this is, is aiming to do, is to provide that kind of environment for people. This is followed by internalization, a conscious embracing of new ethnic social networks, and then internalization and commitment, a willingness to be a, an emissary for your group in the larger community uh, and to function in these diverse group settings. Now, this kind of stepwise program has been uh, established in businesses and in schools and allowing people to come together and ex interact with each other and share these experiences. Um, and it's been very helpful in most of the settings where it's been done. Um, I actually, I mentioned Intel earlier. I went to Intel and there is a, a black employee union, there's an Asian employee union, there's all sorts of different groups that boil down from each of those groups. But it's, it's being very helpful for people to be able to talk about these issues. Now it turns out if you are in the in group, you're not off the hook. In fact, this is something that actually will help identify uh, your own identity, your own racial identity, uh, and come back and be an emissary for your group. Um, so this is the six stages of racial identity in, in the case of the US and, and, and other places where whites are the in group for white people. And this is Janet Helms, who's basically taking William Cross's work and taking it to a different step. And it starts with the same idea. In this case, we, they, she calls it contact, the stage where there's really little attention paid to racial identity. But what's interesting is the in-groups tend to identify themselves as something that's not racial. There's a, there a description by Beverly Tatum of a class where she had a, a very diverse group of students, but about half of them were white. And if you ask them to uh, uh, list three things that describe themselves, the white students would say something like smart, uh, industrious, some description that's really positive about themselves usually, uh, but never any mention of the fact that they were white. If they were women, they might mention that they were women. Men never said they were men. The kids of color, well, that was usually the first thing they said. They identified themselves in terms of the race. All right? So this is something that most people in an in-group, they don't really think about it because they see themselves as quote-unquote normal. And in fact, when the kids in that class were asked to describe their race, some of them used that word, normal, all right? Disintegration, a growing awareness of racism and white privilege. That's a hard thing to come by. I think the first time, other than my own experience with anti-Semitism, that I ever really thought about this, I went to, uh, I actually went to a, what's called a magnet school. It was a, a way to get kids into uh, uh, diverse schools and the magnet school I went to was a math, science, computer school, but it was in a mostly African-American and Hispanic neighborhood, way far away from the very white neighborhood I lived in in La Jolla. And uh, I had a friend named Reg, um, and Reg was African-American, and we'd all just gone to see the second Star Wars movie. I'll never forget this. We waited in line for a really long time. This was back in the 70s, right? And um, we were all going to go back to my house afterwards and hang out and eat popcorn or do whatever it was. We were doing probably something illegal. But... Um, um, but he had kind of a lead foot, and he got to my house before we did, me and my other friend who was with me, and when we pulled up, we'd only been there five minutes after he was maybe 10, uh, there were two policemen, he was outside of his car, and his hands were on top of the car, and we pulled up and, and we said, what's going on here? And we had to convince these officers that Reg was our friend and that he was our guest. Um, and that was the first time, I think, in my life that I actually thought, you know, there's something not right here. Something's different. Certain people are being treated differently. Because I've certainly had white friends sitting in front of my house many times, and no police ever came by. So this realization is something that takes a while for people to experience. And if you've never had to experience that, it's going to take you a while to get to that conclusion. Reintegration, which is learning that dealing with racism in a white society is really, really hard. I've had students come up to me after this, this talk from all white high schools. There's nobody, no kids of color at their high schools. This happens a lot uh, where I am. Um, and they're like, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? And so I said, think about it. Think about every time you hear or tell a racist joke. You're, what's that doing to their greater society? Have some conversations about it. Have these conversations about it. Um, this is a place where people do slip backwards and tend to bl blame the victims of racism. Pseudo-independence, which is finally understanding the consequences of institutional racism, but having no clue about what to do about it, 
Immersion and immersion, sounds familiar? It is. Now you're surrounding yourself now with white anti-racists. So people in your group, the in-group, who feel the same way, who want to try to overcome this. And finally, autonomy, which is separating the values of white supremacy uh, from, from your own values and associating with people of color and whites who are anti-racists. Now, that's really hard, but these are the steps that people are saying we need to achieve if we're all gonna get there, right? The work from William Cross and from Janet Helms, it's been expanded on, people have added to it over the years, but at the end of the day, I think the most important message from those approaches is that we can't be colorblind. Um, colorblindness is just not re realistic, um, and it's not helpful. Uh, we all have different experiences because of who we are, and uh, our, our race, our identity, our, our everything, our gender, um, and or our gender identity. Uh, as a result, it's really important to have opportunities for people who have had similar experiences to come together and immerse themselves amongst people who have had similar experiences so they can openly talk about those experiences in a way that helps them understand what they've been through or what they want to have happen to them. Uh, but also immersion, the immersion step is also equally important. And I think this is true for everybody, not just people of color. I mean, it's true for everybody. Um, that they have this opportunity now to come back into this community and, and kind of you know, spread the news, if you will, you know, and be part of this conversation. And that's the thing, I think we need to keep on talking. There's familiarity, that's very important. Mm. But I think also just having these constant conversations, sometimes uncomfortable ones, that uh, allow people to understand everybody's perspective. Because I think too often we get ourselves, everybody does this, not just white people in this country or, or, or my country, but everybody does this. We, we have our own experience and view of the world. And when find someone tells you that something you've said or done is really hurtful to them, you don't understand it. And then you can never understand it unless they can articulate that. And the only way that's gonna happen is for people to feel comfortable by immersing themselves with groups so they can have those discussions and then coming back and emer emerging and, and being part of the bigger community and the bigger discussion. I wanna end with another piece of good news coming back to baseball. I mentioned in that study uh, uh, back in 2004 and 2006, there was this bias by the, the umpires. Very small things, though, changed that bias, it turns out. One of them was when the teams were in the playoffs, when they were about to go trying to get into the World Series. Suddenly, the bias disappeared. Why? Well, there may be two reasons. One, more experienced umpires. Two, everybody was watching. The other time it disappeared was when the umpires were being reviewed by somebody else for the accuracy of their calls. So it takes just a little bit to overcome even this sort of implicit reaction. Um, and maybe we can be at least happy that in the playoffs, our baseball scores were good. So thank you all. I hope that was interesting and I am happy to take questions. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. So we're certainly open for questions, but could I just try to summarize? What you've said is that all of this is learned, and it's learned from a very early age and very quickly, and there's nothing innate or instinctual. The there's nothing different about brains of a black or a white or any other person. That's correct. Um, there, there is this response that we have um, when we're in, in seeing these unfamiliar faces, um, and we all do that to some degree, uh, but it's how we learn to react to that response that yeah. is key, and that is learned. Yeah. Okay. Put your microphone here. Thank you for that talk, um, wonderful. Um, as a social scientist who's dabbled in the physical scientists, sciences, it's great to be able to see the importance of social science, which is often denigrated, because I go back to Nina Simone's song about Turning Point, in which the kid becomes racist when the kid comes and a mother says, no, you can't play with that black kid, where she didn't understand why, and the mother had to explain to her why she was different. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all social. It's all about why you're in. You know, you can have redheads, and they're all in. And yep. therefore, if you're not a redhead, you're not in. Yep. 
So it, it could be anything, and it's all to do, as you said, with social and learned behaviour. And so it, all this hard wiring is great stuff. It shows us how we embed our social behaviour. And it's not hard science, it's not the physical, it's we've got to understand the social sciences and why we actually do these learned behaviours. And much of what you've said is actually um, tells me that we've got to work much more in understanding better our, the way we as social human beings, not physically, but how as socially we behave. And I don't think we do enough of that. I, I have to fully agree with you. and and. and uh, what's interesting now is that the social science is now being paired with the neuroscience. And, and I think when we start to see how multiple brains in a, in a situation react to different situations, we can start to put this data together uh, and get a better understanding of how to grapple with those very same questions. But you're absolutely right. The other thing, though, of course, is when I was in, in grad school and med school, we were told that the brain is not particularly plastic that we're born with a certain number of nerve cells and it's all downhill from there. And, and certainly there are days I feel that way. Um, but, but the truth is we now know that our brains are incredibly plastic. So a great example of that is, is uh, uh, traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that we can overcome parts of that at least. And what's happening when we overcome that turns out to have to do with rewiring the brain. You're actually changing synapses, you're physically changing numbers of neurons, you're overriding old circuits that are leading to bad behaviors. So there's nothing to say that a badly learned behavior as a child couldn't also be overridden the same way, I, but it does take work, and that's the, that's the downside. Um, Larry, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. There's one point I think I, I didn't fully grasp. There was one slide that you talked to which was on the disbenefits for the racist and you had that the when they're in the stress, seemed like when they're in the stress situation the blood flow is restricted. The bit I didn't understand was if that was the case wouldn't it be the other way? With the fear, with the flight or fight response, wouldn't there be extra blood flow? So actually, the the it wasn't that there was restricted blood flow per se. It was that the cortisol and these other hormonal levels were changing in ways that they were being constantly dumped on you, which can cause blood restriction and and other effects down the line. But it's also causing all these other negative effects. So if you're in a situation where you're under chronic stress, any situation of chronic stress. The, the level of cortisol and some other hormones as well can be very damaging to tissues. And that's, that's a problem. And that's why I really think you can define this as a public health problem. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you could say anything about, the, about any gender differences in um, the neuroscience of racial prejudice, in particular that study that you described in detail about uh, viewing black or white fa faces in an MRI. Has that been done on female participants? Um, so unfortunately, the ones that were done uh, in the U.S. Uh, were among those two sample size, no control studies I mentioned. Um, there was one done in China, uh, and in, Ch in that study they saw the same effect. Um, interestingly, um, it depended a little bit again on the age of the subjects, and they actually that seemed to be more important in the female studies than it was in the male studies. But but there was a, the same effect was there. It was uh, both, actually, yeah. Hey, um, lovely presentation. I actually wanted to talk about something that is, I guess, sort of sensitive, but you seem to be able to sort of, you're expressing that we should talk about these sorts of things. And I was doing um, some research in, um, well, just my own research in IQ and um, racial differences upon that. And um, I found that people of Jewish descent um, on average, um, I'm not sure if you can correct me, but we'll generally have a higher IQ. And I was also trying to sort of link that to the anti-Semitism in which people seem to um, talk about and this sort of like um, Jewish conspiracy. Um, but like, given that IQ is linked with um, greater social success, could this also be linked into other people's prejudice? Um, in, in that sort of sense, as in like, a, a, a social group having great success bio biologically, um, could that perhaps um, be the basis of the Jewish conspiracy that we are seeing today? Huh. That's, a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so my first, my first response regarding IQ studies is that 
most of them are not very good, well done. And, and IQ itself, by the way, uh, it, there's so much controversy over its value uh, as a readout. Um, I think people, and I think we've got some social scientists in the room who will back me up on this. I think, I think the way we're measuring IQ is, is highly variable. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly reliable. To my understanding of people have gone back and really looked at this data carefully, you cannot really assess intelligence one way or the other to one group in terms of a genetic predisposition towards more intelligence. There are genes that will lead to children with higher IQs and adults with higher IQs, but they have other problems. You know, these, so there, it's, there's an aberrancy in terms of how that works. Um, but in terms of labeling that to in, entire groups, I think those data are pretty flawed. And if, maybe you have a comment about that, somebody up, somebody up here. But so I don't know that you can really relate that one way or the other. I think. Um, the rise, the current rise in anti-Semitism to me, I think, is really based on just old ideas, old ideas of prejudice um, uh, against a religious group. Um, Jews, you know, I, I, when I was in Germany, I'll never forget just walking through uh, this one village and there was a plaque about how everything the blue, Jews were blamed for, poisoning the well, uh, you know, uh, the bad weather, um, you know, it, it went down the list. Um, and I think this is just, again, Jews tended to be isolated. They tended to have behaviors that were different from these communities where they lived in, and they were seen as the out group um, and therefore treated as such. I've, I've been trying to um, extend the conclusions, and I may have got this wrong, but let me test it with you anyway. It would seem that what you're suggesting is that if we become more familiar with the unfamiliar, then the levels of stress will ameliorate. Yes. Um, now, in Australia, we've actually, I think, got increased levels of expressed racism as our immigration levels from um, other countries, increasing our levels of diversity, our levels of expressed racism have increased despite the fact that people should be becoming more familiar with the unfamiliar because of the increased levels of diversity. So does that argue against your thesis? I, I don't think so because I think um, you're suggesting that all of these people who are coming to your country, and this is happening in my country too, are people that the in-group are associating with. In my country, they're not. In fact, they're being uh, shuttled off into communities of their own and feeling that they can't integrate and so they they stay to themselves um, and this is a, an unfortunate truth of the history of immigration in the United States uh, and it's many different groups the Irish Americans that came did not integrate they stayed amongst themselves the Italian Americans that came they stayed amongst themselves the Jewish Americans too the African Americans were dragged there um, and never allowed to integrate into, into those societies. So I think that this is happening right now in a modern sense. I think people are, are coming from other places, and if they are different enough, there are, people, there are certainly exceptions, uh, but I think they're being seen as uh, the other, the outsiders, uh, and that's actually exacerbating the racism in both your society and mine. That's my take on it, and that's a, a purely political statement that has nothing to do with neuroscience or data, so. <laughs> The racist responses that are being determined by the in and out groups, can you equate that to also gender, in and out? So can we expect the same level of cortisol responses if you see a male face if you're female, providing you've had that conditioning? Yeah, so the, the study that I mentioned just in answer to somebody else's question suggests that may not be the case, um, but it depends. Um, and it depends on a, a number of different factors that have not been, I think, teased out well enough to make that, that assumption. Um, I actually thought what you were going to get at was um, people's responses to LGBTQ community members. Um, and I think in that case, it's, it's pretty clear that there is a strong response. Uh, and again, it's having to do with the other and not, and be, not being familiar with the, the people. Again, that's my, my take on that. So. Larry, thanks very much. I'm just going to have one myself, sorry. Um, 
there's a few there's a lot in what you said there and I think um, one of the things that um, really came across to me uh, was the, uh, your discussion around epigenetics in particular and how um, mm. how the disadvantage which is really I think structurally ingrained into an oppressed minority and sometimes even a majority uh, in history if you think about it um, how that oppression can actually have an epigenetic effect on perhaps the first generation that's oppressed but then can that turns into a like a, a generational um, uh, on flow um, and if you look at human history you know, like well, you know, which is a pretty grim picture usually if you're any sort of student of history it's a terrific sort of flow of oh my god um, is there an evolutionary sort of and we, we're coming back to the amygdala as being this sort of starting you know where you're, you're actually recognizing a face as either belonging to your tribe I guess or not belonging to your tribe is, is, is that is, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to uh, to uh, I guess uh, have a hypothesis around what would the evolutionary function of that Is particular brain function be, to or, or disadvantage, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, but if, if everyone's doing it. So of course, the the advantage probably to the amygdala response per se was exactly what you're saying. You're trying to protect your own. Your altruism only goes so far, yeah. right? Um, but in terms of the epigenetic response, um, I think. Uh, there's been a lot of people, I mean, you know, I think if there's any evolutionary biologists in the room who have been studying this, there's been a lot of discussion around the idea that we are leaving traces of our social memory in our offspring. Yeah. Uh, we are making, um, the, the joke was, of course, the old Lamarckian idea, right? The, uh, Lamarck said that, you know, we had the experiments where he was cutting off rats' tails um, with the idea that eventually you'll get rats with shorter tails. And of course, you didn't get rats with shorter tails. But maybe if he had tested the ability of their offspring to respond to the sight of a cleaver, mm. right? <laughs> maybe you're doing something that's going to select for uh, the fear, because those rats obviously would have had very high levels of anxiety mm. as a result of that experience. Yes. I think that's been borne out to some degree in some studies of survivors of wars um, and concentration camps and where there's been genera generational uh, evidence of increased uh, anxiety disorders and other disorders. So people are going to be hypervigilant, right, to other things that may to help them avoid those kinds of situations. That makes a lot of sense. That's pure hand waving. Mm. Um, but I think this is sort of the discussion around how these epigenetic changes may be adaptive to some degree. Okay. Well, if there are no more burning questions, could I ask Professor Paul Gorey from RMIT University to give a vote of thanks for the talk tonight? Thanks, David, um, very much for that. Um, this has been a really fantastic experience for me. It's my first time at the Royal Society for Victoria, and I just really, um, I'm just really taken in with this experience, you know, and the building and the um, the whole environment. So I. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I want to thank Larry very much on behalf of um, RMIT, I guess, with our participation in the organising event. So please join me with thanking um, Larry for a, a really great I think you know, we're, we're doubly lucky at RMIT because we get to see Larry give another presentation on Monday on a different topic. So we're looking forward to that. And um, yeah, thank you for all coming tonight. Thank you very much. What I took from putting this talk together, uh, the, probably the two big messages were one, I really am convinced that racism uh, and prejudice uh, are public health problems. Uh, and I think we need to have hard discussions as a society, as individuals and as a society, uh, about how racism has impacted um, our, our, our quality of life as human beings. Um, and I think the cost to everybody is so high that addressing this problem is going to make things much better for all of us so that we can get on with our lives and doing things like fixing the environment and everything else that we need to do, right? Um, so that's one major message. I think that we really have to start seeing this as a public health crisis um, and addressing it as such. Um, the second message that I want to say is that I think, you know, we do, as I mentioned, I think our brains do these things. Our brains uh, in engage in prejudice all the time. Uh, and it may be minor, it may be major in terms of how we react to it. But racism as a practice is a learned behavior. It's not something that we just do because we can't help ourselves. And so if we can unlearn you know, racist tendencies uh, and, un and, and learn how to properly ad address the way our brain sees people, uh, I think we're all going to get along a lot better.